This episode is brought to you by Podcast Assist. Visit facebook.com slash podcast assist for more info on their flat $30 per hour rate. Subscribe with iTunes, Audio Boom, Stitcher, or your favorite podcasting app. And if you enjoy what you hear, like us on Facebook. Also, consider throwing a little cash our way by visiting patreon.com slash koreafm. And find more of our great content on our home on the web, koreafm.net. Barry Welsh's Soul Book and Culture Club recently played host to author Michael Breen, who discussed his newly released book, The New Koreans. To better understand The New Koreans and the questions you'll be hearing here shortly, I recently spoke with Breen for the first of two episodes on this topic on KoreaFM.net. The following is the final chapter of that discussion, featuring audio of the Q&A with author Michael Breen and those in attendance at Barry Welsh's public meeting of the Soul Book and Culture Club. So, of course, thanks to Michael and Barry for their help with this short series, and I hope you enjoy the following Q&A discussion. I'm Chance Storlin for KoreaFM.net. In the more modern period, the, um, there were two sort of things coincided. One was that the uh, leadership was from uh, Kyongnam, uh, or Kyongsando at least. Um, and so, uh, you know, once Korea started to develop, Park Chung-hee, uh, Chun Doo-wan, No Tae-yoo, they were all from that side. And uh, they favored, uh, initially, interestingly, as, as when in Park Chung-hee's revolution, um, there were some North Korean refugees in, uh, in amongst his people, uh, and they, they favored sort of companies that had been started by North Koreans. But there was a sort of internal struggle, and they got pushed out. Then they started favoring uh, companies from the southeast. And then the other thing was Pusan was a natural port to develop because it sort of pointed at Japan. Um, and so for all those reasons, uh, uh, for those reasons, uh, things were stacked a bit against Cholado. Uh, and so when Kim Dae-jung, I, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't know what the story was before Kim Dae-jung, I'm not sure. Um, but Kim Dae-jung articulated um, the sort of aspirations of the Cholado people and their sort of Han, if you like, or their, their emotions and their feeling of being sort of left out. Um, and when you looked at voting patterns in those days, um, it was extraordinary. It was, uh, as you described, it was, uh, well, I say Kim Dae-jung, 90%, uh, No Tae-yoo, 3%, Kim Young-sam, 7%, and you can, uh, you can bet that that 10% were probably people from Kyongnam who were living in Cholado or something. You know, it was that extreme. We used to call him, jokingly, we used to call him the King of Chola. Um, and um, uh, I remember after the 1990, the election when Kim Young sam was elected, 93, I think that was, or 92, December 92, um, when Kim Dae-jung lost again, <coughs> going down to uh, Gwangju um, just to write a story about the atmosphere. And uh, I found that the, uh, I got, I think I went down there about, four days later, something like that. And I went to the market, and the people in the market, I mean, one lady I distinctly remember, I said, oh, I want to talk to you about the election. And she went, hey, hey. <laughs> just, I can't talk about it. Um, and what I found was, uh, well, what they told me was that the market had actually shut down for three days because people felt so wretched. Um, and so I asked, I asked people, um, uh, why? I mean, you know, this is a small... Co- what's the big deal? And one um, lady, one market lady said to me, um, you know, I worked hard all my life. Um, my daughter and my son are in university now in Seoul. Um, if they're ambitious to do something in their life, like they want to get into a big company or work in government or something, um, if Kim Dae-jung had become the president... There would be there would be access all the way to the top for them, you know. they I was talking earlier about alumni. You know, they their alum fellow alumni at Yonsei uh, from Cholado would sort of be in play. But 
but it's all been cut off, so there's no access. So we, it's not just that we're disappointed in the election result, we feel shut out, you know. Um, and I think it's taken quite a long time. And interestingly, the results now show there's still a lot of that there. Um, if the Kwangju um, events had happened in Tegu, they might have been, um, they would have been received very differently here. There was, there was not a lot of sympathy. Well, people didn't exactly know how bad it had been until a long time later, but um, there was not a lot of sympathy because people felt that, oh, those Cholodo people, they're, they're kind of commies anyway, um, you know. Um, which is quite sad, and I, I'd assumed that this was sort of all in the past, but it seems to be still there. Yeah. And just forgive me, one more quick question. To what extent do you think corporate power um, poses a serious threat to Korean democracy, and in, in that corporate power led by Samsung? Um, and uh, to what extent do you think wealth inequality is a serious threat? Uh, not only you know here, but I mean around the world, wealth inequality is a major issue. But if, if you wouldn't mind just speaking on the, on the threat that corporate power, and corporate power has increased tremendously since 2000, uh, 2001 when I first arrived. Yeah. Corporate salaries have increased, executive salaries have gone through the moon. Meanwhile, the salaries for the average people have yeah. remained stagnant. I think, the, I, mean, I think we're all familiar with the um, power of the Chebol, which uh, frankly is a problem. Uh, I remember reading when I first came here, um, reading... Um, articles in the trusty Korea Herald and Korea Times, uh, which were, uh, I think, only four pages there in those days, um, that the government was pledging to uh, restrict the power of the Chebol. And every president since has been saying the same thing. Um, and it's a real problem. There is no other country in the OECD that has this type of phenomena except Sweden, where they have one Chebol which is allowed to exist as a sort of a deal that goes with the government, that you put so much into R&D and you sponsor this, you support this. It's the Wallenbergs, and then we let you function. Uh, in this country, um, the Chebol have enormous power, and it's the reason that it's not nothing's done about it, is part of, apart from their leverage, is I think the country is afraid because um, you're tinkering with something that's been successful. Uh, I mean, let's say, if, if Samsung collapsed overnight, it would be a nightmare for this country. So whatever changes happen have to be done rather gently, and hopefully with Samsung's, uh, you know, cooperation. Um, as for the um, the divide, you know, the rich and poor, I, I'm afraid I can't really answer. I'm not that familiar with that. I mean, I know that ever since I've been here, uh, Koreans that I speak to tell me, oh, we've got a big problem. Uh, but then economists say, actually, the gap here, the wealth gap here is one of the shortest in the world. This is a, the revolution that hit Korea actually went through the country. It wasn't... Um, I once, uh, many years ago, uh, I met a, an economist, an American economist, who was a specialist in the Philippines. And... Um, we sort of, uh, it was a Friday, some event on a Friday, and, you know, we were talking away, and I offered to take him you know, out for dinner the next night. And he said, I don't suppose you could drive me just out of Seoul, could you? Um, I said, yeah, okay, why don't we meet, well, let's meet in the afternoon. So I took him out to Kangwado, and as we got out of Seoul into Kangwado, and this is like 20, 30 years ago, this is 20 years ago, so now, it, you know, and he started freaking out, this guy. He was... Um, and he was going, oh, my God, um, where's the uh, Democratic People's Liberation Front now? You know, he was sort of being sarcastic. But what was exciting him, he was expecting the Stone Age. Once you got out of Seoul, he was expecting extreme poverty. And what he was seeing was the same as he was seeing in Seoul. Um, so um, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I know that it's always an election issue and these issues, but I'm not sure how serious this one is in this country. It's serious in other parts of the world. Uh, in the beginning, you mentioned that um, there are things that you probably want to change from the first book. So I'm just wondering if we can address, like maybe one, share one of the two things, like new insights for this book. And especially uh, about the new generation, like probably was born around your last book and now entering the workforce. I think a couple of days ago, I called the figures like a uh, general Unemployment rate is like 
11.2, but for the young people, it's like 11.2. So I sense like great anxiety, if you can speak about maybe the young generation. Thank you. So on the first thing, um, <coughs> the, um, the kind of framework that I tried to think of for the last book, the thing is when you write a book, um, you know, a journalist is used to writing 700 or 1,000 word stories. And um, there's at least two journalists here who've written books, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, to, to write an entire book is mentally a very difficult thing at first because your instinct is to drop 700 word stories into it. You know, so the reason I sort of struggled over this one was to to try and come up with the conceptual framework for the whole book that would be sustained through the whole thing, and that's where I found I differed. I disagree with what I said before. And what I said before was I used the image of miracles, which is not original. It's um, you know the miracle on the Han River has long been used to describe the economic growth, and the political miracle. That, quite familiar with that. And I suggested that the next miracle that we're waiting for is reunification. But um, I, I, when I said earlier about the significance of Korea, what the Koreans have done for the world, I can't quite see how unification now is going to be that significant um, because the Koreans are the last to do it. If you, if you accept North Korea as a communist country, if you see it as something else, then maybe the unification of the two Koreas might inspire the world in some way. But I suspect it's going to be, oh, God, at last, that problem's solved. You know, what took you so long? You fractious people, you, you know? So I thought that the third miracle is actually, it's a more nebulous thing. It, it's, it, it's cultural, for want of a better word, but um, it, it's... It's a kind of an affirmation of things Korean, Korean culture. It's like the world is becoming familiar with Korea in the way it's familiar with France and Australia and uh, Canada and the UK, countries like that. The Koreans are sort of sitting up alongside it. Uh, and they've come from the back of the line in terms of knowledge and awareness. And... The, and they're familiar in terms of, the familiarity comes in terms of individuals, athletes, writers, uh, cuisine, all sorts of, you know, it gets expressed in different ways. But to me, I think for, uh, for the Koreans above all, that is a miracle. Um, so that, that's sort of the big difference, is that sort of approach. The thing about young people, um, yeah, you've got a, what I hear is that it's not there's a shortage of jobs. It's there's a shortage of you've got seventy percent of young Koreans graduate from university, and there's a shortage of jobs at that level. And uh, I mean, I I'm very aware of this because I, I have it in my family, my wife's family. Um, and you have young people who are who dream big, um, and then lack the credentials. Frankly, in this society, if you haven't been to two or three universities, um, you're not seen as having the credentials to get to the top somewhere. And are those universities any better than the others? I doubt it, frankly. Um, uh, Solnash University hires the people, uh, takes in the people who score the highest in the sunung. What is that a measure of? Oh, it's a measure of your ability to do the sunung. But you go through life. I mean, my wife was telling me yesterday she met, uh, she went to this um, philosophy lecture and she was sitting next to an 80-year-old man who sort of introduced himself. The first thing he said to her was, I went to Solnash University. He's <laughs> like, he's still living off this thing. You know? um, and I think it's, I think what Korea needs is to encourage people to diversify their ambition. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, earlier you said, uh, you were mentioned the student protests, and I was just curious on what your opinion was on um, how they were so ineffectual that you said that uh, they accomplished absolutely nothing. Mm. I think I was being a bit unkind um, because there was... Um, 
a lot of sacrifice and a lot of effort and energy and sincerity went into that, into their demos, and they they were representing the conscience of the country, of the people. So um, I should perhaps withdraw. I, I I don't mean it to sound as negative, but it didn't do any good. That was the problem. It didn't uh, it didn't shift. Um, one thing I've sort of learned about life watching this thing is if you want to go to another country and start a revolution, you, you, once the middle class come in, something changes. If, if, if the people with the power are able to identify the people protesting against them, oh, that's students, okay, he's going to get a job a couple of years later. I mean, I've got friends who are in Jusapa, you know, the pro-North Korean Juche group, one friend, a very uh, guy I know very well, uh, he's he's an accountant. Do you know what I mean? It's like if you can identify the group, but but once the middle class get in, it's like then you have a problem. And this in the thing I was describing earlier in June, um, I remember sitting in a coffee shop down the road here. Um, uh, just as, as you come down from the cathedral, there was a coffee shop on the second floor which used to be my spot for watching the demos, because Myeongdong Cathedral was the cent center point of the demos, um, because the police didn't go in there to grab the people. So that was the center. And if you're a photographer, you have to go up there at the front. If you're a print journalist, you can sit back in comfort in a coffee shop um, and without the tear gas coming in the window and watch what's going on. You know. And I remember one lunchtime, there's a, li there's a little umbrella store and a handbag store in front of me and it was blocked off by riot police and there was a guy who he must have been a banker probably going down to KEB down here or something wanted to go through and they wouldn't let him through and he went berserk he went apeshit at these people and it was almost like 5,000 years of history was behind him he just sort of went totally mental and the police started to um, respond, and he was saved by some Ajimas wielding umbrellas. And I was sort of thinking, what the hell is going on here? This is so the students you can almost dismiss. Do you see what I mean? That it's almost like they, oh, that's this is what they do. Once it got to this point, um, and what happened there was a very interesting moment during that three weeks. The the Washington Post was the first one to report. This is a middle-class revolution. Um, and the government sent the Minister of Culture, and I remember I saw this, he, he sent the, they sent the Minister of Culture up to the front of Myeongdong Cathedral to check out for himself, presumably, whether this was a middle-class revolution. And he got unceremoniously chased down the street by, you bastard, you know, by these protesters, and he ran off down the, the street. Um, so, and I think he must have reported in and said, this is a middle-class revolution. And once they realized that, then they started to cave, you know. So when I say the students weren't effective, uh, I don't mean it unkindly. It's just in a political sense that they, they nothing got achieved uh, through all of the protests. Any more questions? Okay. Hi. Oh, Hello. Okay, if what you, uh, with what you said about the impeachment and the institutional failing and the judiciary kind of stepping in as a balancing force, right? <laughs> Am I? Did I say that? Yeah, did I, did I understand it correctly? No? So with the, I think I agree with what you said about kind of prosecutor being kind of like uh, lawyers for the people. Like, they kind of do interpret law as what people right. want them to do, right? right. <laughs> do you think it's... I see what you get, yeah. 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 Um. <laughs> do you think it's possible that mm. them acting that way, them being kind of a objective or independent, do you think it's likely or possible? I think, actually, I'm glad you asked that because I think I missed... Uh, I missed something, or I misspoke, because um, when I said that the prosecutors were sort of doing the will of the people and, and need to find an excuse to 
to jail. Well, of course, that's what prosecutors do. Yeah. Um, and uh, the court system, hopefully, uh, often in Korea, at the end of the process, um, if there's an appeal and then it goes to the Supreme Court, at the end of the process, often decisions are rational and fair. The problem is that the public sentiment needs, sort of needs to be managed along the way. And I think there are some elements of the way the prosecutors behave which, are very, which need to be addressed. For example, um, Park Geun-hye, uh, Lee Jae-young of Samsung, and Che soon shil are all in jail. Why? Why are they in jail? There's only two reasons to put somebody in jail before they're found guilty of anything. One is if you think they're going to run away, and they're probably not going to do that. Uh, Chase and Steele actually came back, you know. Um, and the other is if they're going to destroy evidence. Now, frankly, if Park Gane hasn't destroyed all the evidence already, then she's an idiot. Um, or she'll have other people doing that for her. So that's not a... So why, why are they... Why are they put in jail? They're put in jail. And you know something? Lawyers will tell you that when a judge is considering whether to, you know, the, the prosecutor has to go to the judge and ask for a warrant, or whatever the word is, to, to jail somebody. Um, the judge, when they're considering that, is actually wondering himself, how guilty is this person? Because if this person may not be guilty, I don't want to issue the warrant, because by them going to jail, it makes them look guilty. You know? So the next time you see the picture of that person, they've got probably the, the blue uniform. Look at E.J. Young. The vice chairman of Samsung is brought into a court to, for an intellectual crime, if you like. He's not guilty yet. He's brought in with ropes around his arms. This is outrageous. This is what fascist governments do. It's, and, and America does it as well, but anyway, that's another story. But um, it's called the perp walk in America. Um, and I think the... But the bit of the thing, I'm glad you asked the question, because I think the part of this is I think the courts will end up doing something rational. We might find that there... I suspect that the prosecutors are having a huge problem because they haven't got any evidence... And the only way that they can have a case is if Park Gane, E. J. Young, Chase and Shill, or one of the entourage confesses. And so prosecutors are specialists in making you to confess to their scenario. Here's my scenario. Did you do this? No. Did the president tell you to do this? No. Okay. Stand up, face the wall. This actually happened in a case. And stand up, face the wall and don't sit down till I come back. And the guy comes back five hours later and carries on the... That's how they do it. So they'll try and break them. And then finally someone will say, well, maybe she said this. Gotcha. And then once you're in the court, you can't say, um, oh, I was, that was under duress. Uh, I withdraw that statement. It's too late. You've made it in the legal system here. So... Uh, this is why I, I, I think the prosecutors responding to public sentiment is problematic because the, I think the system doesn't control them well enough. Thank you. Oh, hello. Mm. Actually, I find your book in Singapore, uh, one of the famous Singapore bookstores. Uh, at there, uh, your book is interested interested in like uh, uh, the recommended book for the recommended new book like in like this the new Korean. Uh, but as I, in my op humble opinion, uh, Korean haven't changed dram dramatically. But uh, I don't know why Korean, why now Korea is a very uh, hot ish country. Uh, could you explain? Uh, it's, an it's an interesting thing, and I'll take this opportunity to um, apologize for the title, which is not my idea. You know, publishers pick the title. <laughs> the only reason it's the New Koreans is because my old book was called The Koreans. Uh, and my next book is either going to be The Unified Koreans or The Brand New Koreans. Uh, so I wouldn't... It's not like the Koreans are suddenly... There's a transformation 
in the last 10 years, as, you know. Um, but um, why Korea is hot? It's, I, th- I think, frankly, it's North Korea. It's um, uh, North Korea about when Bill Clinton was the president of America. When was that? 15 odd years ago. Uh, the North Korea issue before that in America had been handled in the State Department and else or the military defense. You know. Then it, it got to the desk of the American president. Right now, it's a top foreign policy issue for the American president. Actually, it has been for several years. And I think you might remember reading in the papers um, one thing Obama said to Donald Trump. He said, uh, this is going to be the biggest headache for you, North Korea. So North Korea has shone a light on South Korea. Um, And at the same time, uh, there's a lot of expectation that uh, South Korean literature, um, movies, dramas, music, um, well, it's already winning prizes, but but we'll, we'll be spreading more and more. So in the publishing world, about three years ago, Korea was a really hot topic, and a whole slew of books. If you look back, if you type in Korea on um, Amazon and look at the books that have come out in the last three years, mostly about North Korea, you see there's a whole bunch, and there's a lot of very good books, very interesting books, and there's, a, there's kind of sub-genres, like um, the beautiful woman who escaped genre. There's about four <laughs> books like that, and they've all got their picture on the front. You know, It's sort of... You know, feel very sorry for this person. Then you've got um, the North Korean nuclear issue and things like that. Um, so I think uh, uh, th- those are the two reasons, I think. Thank you. And sorry, uh, one short question, please. Uh, do you have any plan for translation, Korean translation for this book, of this book? Um, I, hope, I hope this is um, something that happens uh, with publishers usually. So what happens is... Um, a Korean agent sort of approaches the, um, the publisher and says, you know, let me try and find you a publisher in Korea. <laughs> and then the publisher arranges a translator. And so it usually, if that happens, it usually takes about a year. So, uh, so far it hasn't happened yet. So I don't know if there's no interest. I've got, I've got Chinese, um, I've got Chinese language um, uh, done, but the other, no other languages yet. Uh, so it all takes a bit of time. Um, my question is about uh, what you uh, make of uh, Korean demo- South Korean democracy uh, in, in a historical, from a historical perspective. I mean, do you see it as something that uh, has a firm precedence in, in uh, Korean history? Or is it the result of a kind of rupture, you know, um, the result of the, the kind of the uh, incredible destruction of war, you know, that created a sort of vacuum, you know, for um, a, um, I guess, you know, foreign political system to, to take root. And, um, and, of course, I mean, many of the sort of debates about uh, the sort of the nature of democracy often get um, acrimonious when it moves into the sphere of, of how does it relate to, to civilization, you know, for example, you know, but um, of course, if you look at uh, British parliamentary democracy, I mean, there's a kind of point of reference in the form of the rights of Englishmen, right? Um, which, uh, according to which, the Puritans, uh, um, you know, chopped off the head of Charles I or whatever. Um, but, but I'm wondering, is there any kind of equivalent in um, in uh, in Korea, or do you see any kind of equivalent? And is perhaps the lack of an equivalent um, does that account for the uh, state of the rule of law in in Korea, like the the real uh, absence of, of the rule of law here? You're way over my head, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know, to be honest. I don't know. Uh, from the historical uh, point of view, I mean, my, uh, you know, I'm sort of an observer of these things. I'm not really, stu- I'm not really an expert in, in that I've studied it, so um, it's hard to answer. My, so my perspective on democracy is, uh, my assumption is that uh, there were no roots for it earlier on. That it it essentially came because this country was allied to America, and it didn't come to North Korea because that country was allied with the uh, Soviet Union. Um, uh, but having said that, there's a the the sort of the fertile ground 
upon which I think democracy is settled here, because there's a great sense of egalitarianism in Korea, which uh, seems to contradict the old sort of caste system that used to exist. There was a sort of social revolution that started at the end of the 19th century and, and went sort of through the Japanese period where, where the, the previous downtrodden people sort of were liberated. Um, you know, butchers, for example, the scum of the earth, um, butchers were, were then allowed to send their children to school. And this caused riots, apparently, at the time. But, um, and then the, in modern South Korea, the, the people who led the development here were the, the dictatorship were the soldiers and the merchants, the chebol. These are two very low-class uh, types of people in the old days. You know? So there was a sort of um, a, a social revolution that I think created the... Uh, and then the other part of it is the... Um, you know, this is, a con- this is also a country... Korea is an interesting place. It's, it's a country that's bordered on three sides by the sea. And yet, for centuries, it's sort of huddled in villages in the mountains, you know. And finally, Koreans, something liberated the Koreans, and they became what they should have been for centuries, traders. Koreans are great traders, you know. Yeah, they close off their markets. Why not? Smart thing to do. It's not because they're against the outside. Um, and Koreans sort of look at what the rest of the world is doing, and particularly America, their sort of mentor. And I want that. They actually have an idealized version I think uh, Korea has often assumed that things European and American, North American, are better than what they have, which is not... Uh, we who, who come from those places know that this isn't always the case. Um, and so I think uh, those are the factors that I can follow. I'm not sure about the historical uh, part of the equation. So I have a question about the Korean corporate culture. Um, so I have found many Koreans, like my friends, especially young people, are suffering with the Korean corporate culture, like late night work or seniority or like go on a hiking on weekend. So which is seems a little hard to be out, like out of control or hard to be fixed. So I was wondering, like, have you ever come up with any idea to make this better, like Korean working culture better? Work for a foreign company. <laughs> we, um, you know, in the uh, in the PR business, which is my day job, um, most of the PR companies like mine uh, have been competing to get multinational business from multinational companies wanting to deal with the Korean media. What we're starting to do now is to get business from Korean companies who want sort of their PR. Um, not with the foreign press here, but overseas, you know, particularly with the trade media in Europe and places like that. Um, and so, I mean, I know at least one big PR company that had a policy of refusing to work for Korean clients because they were so abusive. Um, and uh, we, we in my company... And one of my colleagues who's at the back there knows more about this than I do because he's involved in it directly. Um, we've got one uh, very famous Korean client who doesn't seem to realize that um, human beings have to sleep. Um, <laughs> doesn't see anything wrong with ringing you up at 6 o'clock on a Friday night asking you to do something that's going to take 24 hours and they want it by Monday morning. Um, and... Uh, but the interesting thing is is that in, in our own company, the slightly older people, the, so by that I mean, let's say the people in their 20s, people who are over 35, um, get that and sort of see that this is what you have to do, whereas the young people don't like it at all. And, and I'm not sure what has caused that change. But this uh, corporate culture thing is, um, you know, some of these... Uh, um, companies are very, very um, militaristic, and it kind of works when you're um, producing physical goods. Um, but when you're producing, you know, in the service industry and thing, it's very interesting to see how that kind of works. Um, 
with uh, where people have to be more creative. It's a very amusing thing. If you, you remember the movie Avatar, when Avatar came out? Samsung executives were ordered to go and see it um, <laughs> to make them more creative. <laughs> it's like, um, you know, <laughs> off we go, sort of thing. Um, so uh, I don't know how you would how how this is going to be addressed, um, but it's it's also something to do with it's not just you know Korea is particularly tough on this area, but there's another aspect to this I find interesting, which is that in the modern world, in the sort of the uh, you know those we're sort of living in the OECD world in developed countries, people get their identity. Where do people get their identity from? Like who are you? There's usually two things. In an international setting, it's what country you're from. Why is that so important? Why don't people say, oh, I'm from Busan, or oh, I'm from Edinburgh? No, but we, we identify ourselves by country. I'm an American. Okay. Um, who gives a shit? Um, the other one is by your job. You know, so one reason people work so hard uh, is is not just they're afraid of being fi- well. That, afraid of being fired used to be one of the reasons, but it, it's an identity. It's where people draw their identity from. If society changed and so Koreans were drawing their identity from other things, you know, like I'm Jinsu's father, uh, and I I play, you know, I would do water skiing at weekends. Um, and then when I'm asked to do overtime, I say no. Why? Because I'm running a water skiing club. You know, if your identity, if you have other means to, you know, and and the and the companies aren't allowed to claim your identity 100 percent, that might start to change. I think. Well, uh, I have a question. Uh, I'm local. I'm born and grew up here. I'm here. Yes. Uh, we, uh, we have a new president came, and then the, I don't know how much. You followed the news that a couple of days ago, uh, he said that uh, at the 18th of May, which is all part what happened in the Gwangju, 1980, for example, uh, the first time he, uh, as a president, he said that he will find out uh, actually uh, who started it, which is a really big news for us. So something like that, uh, on, based on your experiences, uh, it change something in Korea? Like, it's just the media saying or... Uh, I think uh, I realized that there are many information that we were brainwashed in the wrong way, and then I feel like uh, many young people we are trying to find what it is about. So, do you think it's the, just uh, because a new presidency came, it's just something happening, or can you see the actually really change compared to before what happened in Korea? You, you, you mean specifically about what happened in Gwangju? Yeah, for yeah. example, like I think uh, yeah. he's, uh, you know, something. I yeah. think it's pretty, uh, it's very new compared to the other president. Kind of radical new statement. The way how he's doing looks much better than before. I don't know how much true or not, but so far, so is it something new to you, for you to see that as a Korean president does something like that? Or? Well, um, there were. Um, I'm trying to remember when this was now. The when was it that? Don, can you help me with this? When was it that No Mu Hyun became famous with the Kwangju hearings? Was that under No Taeyu? The hearings into Kwangju? Was it? Was it? Ah, okay. I, th- I thought it was earlier than that, but anyway. Um, But I think under No Taeyu, if I remember, were the first National Assembly hearings on Kwangju. Yeah, I think it was, yeah. So anyway, um, so going back, there were sort of investigations, um, and it was kind of left a bit hanging. You know, and Chun Doo-wan and No Taeyu, uh, as Don Kirk just said, um, were tried for this, and sentenced. Chun Doo-wan was sentenced to death. Um, so there has been a lot of investigation. I think the but there's a feeling that we don't know everything yet. Um, one of the things I think uh, President Moon was referring to was there was a point during the uh, events in Kwangju when um, that you were at, you were there, right? Yeah, he was down there. So uh, where there were peop- uh, soldiers shooting from helicopters at the people, and he wanted to find out who gave the order. It's like to try and get the specific responsibility. 
Um, so I think that's good. And the, but that sort of thing has happened before. You know, Kim Dae Jung's people had a list when he came in of things that they wanted to investigate, and they didn't get to all of them. Under Noam Hyun, there was the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission. Was it called that? Uh, started to research into the um, thing, you know, in the when the Korean War broke out, the South Korean government um, massacred tens of thousands of leftist prisoners. Um, and in those days, it's enough for your neighbor to see you've got a book uh, for them to shop you and say you're a leftist and you just get... Uh, I actually have a friend whose mother was killed like that, whose grand grandmother was killed like that because my friend's father as a young man was arrested by the police for being a leftist in Seoul. His mother along with his sister, his mother went to their mother went to the jail and bribed the guards to change places with them and she got executed and this is all because a neighbor shot them. So these, you know, these very dodgy things but the Truth Commission started to look into this, and they identified victims and things like that, then the Im Young Bak uh, government stopped the funding for that because I think there was a feeling it was sort of getting political and uh, the left was using it against the right. So there's still a lot more of that. So I think from the investigation point of view, I think that's a good thing, and I th I'm sure they will look into something, and they'll probably find that there were local commanders who made decisions, um, unfortunately, you know. The other part of it I found interesting is um, he said something, I forget how he um, put this now, but he said something about he was go in the rewriting of the Constitution, there was going to be a mention of the Kwangju democratization movement, right? There was some of that. And uh, a lot of people would think, um, what are you talking about? That wasn't a... That was a, the Kwangju uprising, as it was called, before it became called the democratization movement, was a reaction against pol brutal policing. And the real problem was they, when martial law came in around the country, they stupidly sent, sent special forces down to the universities at Kwangju. And special forces are trained to kill people. And they started behaving as special forces, and the citizens reacted. So that's what happened in Kwangju. It wasn't sort of a pro democracy movement per se. Do you see what I mean? So a lot of people think, um, oh, what are you talking about? That's not what it was. But I think it's very important because, and I'll try and, uh, I, I'll, I'll try and express this briefly. Um, I think Koreans have a huge uh, dilemma on their hands about national identity. Okay. Uh, we see ourselves in Korea as part, we, as part of a, an ethnic group with a long history. Um, and our modern identity goes back to, some people say it started with the Samuel movement, you know, when there was the first sense of nationhood and stuff like that. And we got... Uh, liberated from Japan, then divided, then there was a war, and now we've got the North Korean, you know. Um, but there are some huge difficulties with this. Um, one, of, one is, for example, the South Koreans suffered more in the four years after liberation under their fellow Koreans than they did under the Japanese for 40 years. And then you had a war. There were more people killed and brutalized uh, from 1945 to 1950, before the war, than had been by the beastly Japanese. That is a fact. But, but when I've said this to people, uh, I hope nobody here is upset about this, but it makes people furious. And they almost sort of say, well, being killed by a Korean isn't a problem. It's being killed by a Japanese. Is, um, okay, tell that to your wife. Um, and other things, the comfort women story. There's people, they're trying to put scholars in jail for researching on this. Why? Because there's a, a narrative, a myth here that um, these women were all frog-marched into brothels by beastly Japanese. You know, the truth is more complex than that. 
And the difficulty of handling, uh, dealing with it is because how can we, you know, we love our country, um, so we deny that we were like that. The solution is to find your identity as a democracy. Before we were a democracy, we weren't very nice. This is why, as a British person, if you start telling me about the atrocities committed by British people, I, th I share with you that they're awful. I don't try and defend them because my identity uh, is sort of with civili as a civilized Britain. Do you know what I mean? So I think for c modern Korea needs to find its identi identity uh, in its new identity as a democracy. Then it can explain all the bad things that we weren't a democracy then. Uh, and that's why putting the Kwangju incident in, this is all part of the democratization story. Putting that in the Constitution, I think, is very profound. Oh, Andy, nothing from you? Uh, just, uh, just, following up on, uh, just following up on some what you were just saying, uh, or some of what you were just saying, the, how do you explain the phenomenon of corruption in this country? Uh, we had a case corruption. the other day where... Uh, <laughs> the, a, a prosecutor was giving great envelopes of cash to younger prosecutors for their good work. And, of course, um, President Moon has, uh, has gone after them. But it just seemed amazing to me that after all these cases that we've been reading about, the prosecutors would be, would be caught red-handed, literally, uh, handing out hundreds of thousands of cash in envelopes to younger prosecutors for for their good work and apparently not going after somebody that maybe they should have been going after. Well, Don, you're, you're a journalist, so you, you look at corruption as a bad thing. Um, I, I look at it as a kind I, of this a... This is an interesting thing, <laughs> that's all. I, I look at it as a sort of a clash of virtues. Um, and, uh, you know, I think um, a senior prosecutor spreading largesse... Or, you know, in, back in the 50s... Um, bureaucrats in this country, uh, their salaries were not enough to feed their families. This is why they leveraged their positions to to get money. There was a sort of uh, they were expected to do that, and we've we've broken away from that. But there's a, there's also a cultural thing. Uh, it's a virtue of of looking after your juniors. You know, if you go out for a lunch with your juniors, you have to pay. You know, and so. Uh, I'm not justifying that the prosecutor's doing that. I'm trying to explain why it might happen. But the ver from the point of view of a whole society, what might be virtuous in a small group then no longer applies. When you've got prosecutor, I'm not, I don't, I doubt if he's saying, yeah, mate, oh, you dropped that case, well done, here's a few quid. I don't think it's like that. I think it's sort of largesse. Um, and... Um, I'm as puzzled by you. Why you open up the paper every day? There's cases every day. Well, how? Why this keeps going? I've no idea. Um, I think the uh, it's. I think a lot of people must feel. I mean, there's so many stories about this over the years. There must be some people who've been done several times, you know. And um, it must just be that most people get away with it, and the ones who don't sort of think, oh, bad luck. But I do think the country is improving, you know, step by step on that score. Hi. Um, I, I just have two questions. The first one is really quick, but uh, and it's a little self-indulgent, but uh, I lived in uh, Sapporo, Japan, about 20, 25 years ago, and I had a friend there. You're, are, you're from originally from Salisbury, is that correct, in England? Um, no, my daughter was at university there. But, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then... Uh, but then, I've been there. Yeah. Okay, well, he was from Salisbury, and I just wanted to ask if you might have known him, him or his family, but it's not, it's probably... Not Harry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so nix that one. Um, <laughs> uh, um, the other question is, I, uh, one of my friends from Japan I hadn't seen in, in about 20 years, just uh, by chance, was in town uh, at a hotel not far from here the other day, and he's nervous about Abe Shinzo, and he thinks that um, it's possible that... that uh, that Japan may uh, return to this sort of more militaristic uh, approach, and he's he said he thinks that 
right now the country is evenly divided, about 50-50 between, you know, pro and anti-military as far as, you know, using the military as an aggressive force instead of as a defensive force. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that, and especially in relation to what's going on in North Korea mm. and uh, Kim Jong-un's antics. <laughs> Yeah, I think the um, uh, I mean I understand the concern, and that I think that concern is sort of a domestic one within Japan. Um, you know, will he um, change the constitution? Will Will Japan start to get involved in international peacekeeping um, and and other invasions? Um, and I somehow doubt that that will go that far. But certainly the Japanese are extremely concerned about North Korea. If you notice, every time they test a missile, you know which direction it goes in. Um, and if the Americans were to hit the North Koreans in some way and they wanted to retaliate, what better way to do it than fire off uh, a missile in direction, you know. So I think there's a concern there, um, which is quite understandable. The other thing I would point out is... Um, that should not bother South Koreans. You know, this whole thing about Japan is weird to me. Uh, these countries, South Korea and Japan, are the two most natural close allies in this part of the world. If you look at countries in terms of their values, so going back to what I said about being a democracy, Japan is a democracy. Whatever it did 70 years ago, press-ganging young men to become prisoner of war camp guards, and uh, women, comfort women, so like that. That was when it was a fascist military country. It's a democracy now. It's an advanced, very civilized country. Um, and I'm sure you agree that Japanese people, you know, are very nice people, you know. Um, it's not like they've all got horns sticking out their heads or something like that. Um, and South Korea is a democracy, believes in, you know, market economy, freedom, respect for human rights, <coughs> and all that sort of thing. So these are natural allies because China doesn't believe that yet. Hopefully it will quite soon. North Korea doesn't believe that yet. Uh, hopefully it will, uh, you know. But these countries are allies. They're also both American allies. So the idea that Korea is somehow threatened by um, Japanese militarization, I think, is some kind of um, knee-jerk emotional reaction to, you know, what you've been taught at school about history, you know. Okay, I'm afraid that really is all we have time for. Uh, so can we please give our special guest a very large round of applause? This episode is brought to you by Podcast Assist, offering voiceovers, audio editing and mastering, transcriptions and show notes, episode summaries, and even hosting a podcast on a topic important to you. Visit Facebook.com slash Podcast Assist for more info on their flat $30 per hour rate. Talk radio, music, and podcasts from the Korean Peninsula. KoreaFM.net.